Hello and welcome to Go as a Top Level SDK. I'm Robert Burke, a senior software engineer at Google and a committer on the Apache Beam project. I've been working with the Go SDK on behalf of Google for about four years now. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on what makes a Beam SDK and with a focus on how we implemented one with Go. A language's features affects its design as a Beam SDK and Go is very different from Python and Java. But first, what does a top-level SDK even mean? Uh, when I was first suggested to do this talk, I actually didn't have much of a clue. It's not a term we use in Beam. It doesn't show up in the glossary. So ultimately, this talk is what I feel being a top-level Beam SDK is about, at least as far as uh, the user perspective is concerned. If I'd have to draw a line to start, uh, a top-level SDK is one that lives in the Beam GitHub repository and is maintained by the Beam community. That doesn't quite cover it exactly. We currently have uh, four SDKs in the, uh, the, uh, the repo uh, with Java, Python, and Go, and now TypeScript. Uh, TypeScript was only added to the repo about a week ago and is currently experimental. So while it's in the Beam repository, I wouldn't call it a top-level SDK yet. Uh, this definition excludes a uh, SIO, which is a Scala-based version of the SDK uh, built heavily on top of the Java SDK. But it does not live in the Beam repository and is often its own place in GitHub. So it's excluded by default right now. Um, that leaves uh, the, other three, uh, the other three languages. Java was first, Python came second, and after a long period of being experimental, came the Go SDK. So that gives us a few requirements to start with. A top-level SDK is an SDK that implements the Beam model, lives in the Beam repository, and is maintained by the Beam community, and of course, is not experimental. Uh, these are useful from the user point of view, since users are a part of the community, and they're empowered to change and improve the SDKs as they need them. This is the value of Beam being open source. Implement, now, implementing the Beam model to some degree is required. SDKs that don't do this obviously can't be Beam SDKs, let alone a top level one. Being in the Beam repo makes them easier to find and contribute to. Not being experimental means that users can trust that the SDK is tested and isn't likely to introduce reduce breaking changes to their uh, jobs that they've written. Working code written should continue to work between updates. But that doesn't feel like it's enough, does it? The Go SDK is all of these, but what else makes it a top-level SDK? Perhaps we'll figure out more features of a top-level SDK as we go on. So for that, we'll need to look deeper. So for those of you who don't know, Go is a programming language. The apocryphal story is that Go was originally conceived of during a long C++ compilation. The Go authors took that as a sign that programming could be faster and focused on making a new language that's easier to read, easier to write, compiles quickly, and executes quickly. This ethos drove the design of the language, leading to one that is strongly typed, statically compiled, and avoids inheritance and overloading. On top of that, it brings concurrency into the language itself instead of leaving it to libraries. It also has a standard library that is useful for the internet age with web servers and handlers and goodness, crypto, lots and lots of crypto. And I mean for the encryption kind, not the NFT kind. None of these ideas were new, but they had not come together in this way before. I find it personally useful and so does Google. And others actually seem to agree in the last, goodness, 12, 13 years since Go uh, was released. Uh, it has become the cloud, or the language upon which the cloud is built, powering things like Docker and Kubernetes. Uh, until very recently, Go didn't have generics. So uh, as a result, uh, parts of this talk might become out of date very quickly uh, because we're already considering how we can change the SDK uh, with generics in Go. 
like with any programming language, Go's features and affordances affect how people design APIs and the resulting SDKs. That directly affects the user experience from initial authoring to how to deploy it to production. Let's start with that last point, deploying to production and move backwards. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to be omitting points on how Beam is architected, nor will this talk teach Go generally. There are plenty of other talks that have covered that before. Uh, so as a result, uh, as I've mentioned already, there should be time for questions after the talk, and I'll also be available to answer questions in the Beam College Slack afterwards. So uh, on to deployment. Of all the SDK languages, Go is the only one that must be statically compiled into an architecture-specific architecture executable. So that means it needs to match, the, the executable that you have needs to match the OS and the CPU architecture of the, uh, the, 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 the machine in question. Python can be interpreted. Java compiles to bytecode executed on a JVM. Both of them can have resources dynamically loaded at runtime via modules or jars but neither of them particularly care whether you're running on x86 or on an M1 processor, as long as the runtimes are available in the container. For Go, everything the binary needs to run is included in the executable at compilation time. This is great for portability. No managing downloads of libraries or preloading them into containers. Uh, and Assuming you're developing on the same OS and architecture that your pipelines workers are running on, you're already there. Um, but does this mean you can't deploy to the Linux-based cloud on your M1 Mac? No, of course not. It just means that your code needs to compile twice, once for the platform launching the pipeline and once for the platform uh, used by the pipeline workers. Java's compile once, run anywhere, this is not. Go has a robust cross-compile support for different architectures, making this pretty easy. Uh, we simply set the target architecture with the goose and garch uh, our environment variables and run go build. I have it on good authority. That's how you pronounce those. Uh, the SDK will even attempt to do this for you in some cases, uh, targeting the common Linux AMD64 platform. Either way, voila a Go binary for your target architecture. To use this for deploying uh, to production, you take your two binaries, uh, set the worker binary flag to the worker, er, to the executable that you want for workers when starting your pipeline, and then launch your pipeline. The runner will then uh, take care of the rest. The binaries are otherwise multimodal, and will behave either as pipeline workers or as your main program in order to launch the job as needed. Uh, you can see the Go cross compilation page on the Beam site for more information. Next is how the language affects pipeline construction. This is where Go's previous lack of generics came into play, along with the lack of inheritance, its lack of function overloading, and its lack of annotations. How these intersect with strong typing, first-class functions, full-type reflection, and multiple return values led to this current SDK. For Beam, the SDK is an implementation of the Beam abstract model. A simple interpretation of this is how users express the p-transforms they want to apply on the p-collections in their pipeline. The SDK is there to make sure everything makes sense and that it can execute your do funds at pipeline execution time while catching potential runtime errors earlier at pipeline construction time. So let's take a look at how this looks for Go. We get our pipeline object and root scope. Uh, we pass each transform the scope and their input, and in turn, they return a P collection that can be used downstream. When the pipeline is constructed, we can pass it to the run function and be sent off to some runner for execution. As per Go style, uh, the types on variables don't need to be specified manually in many cases, uh, though everything is type checked by the compiler. This makes the Go code lightweight to change. 
though uh, you may just need to take my word for it that the variables lines counted and formatted are beam key collections. In the Go SDK, key collections maintain the types from their parent to do funds implicitly so that the pipeline can be type checked at construction time rather than compile time. The lack of generics meant that we couldn't have the compiler ensure this for us. So much of the front end of the SDK uh, binds types and verifies that the pipeline fits together. In practice, goes fast compiles and the SDK's ever improving error messages, uh, mistakes easily, easy enough to fix. On to P transforms. Instead of applying transforms to P collections, Go's lightweight variables are declared and passed down as needed to build a pipeline. The lack of function overloading, but multiple return parameters means that Go went with a different approach. To use transforms with multiple output P collections, we have already specialized Pardu functions so that users can indicate the number of output P collections. This allows at least some aspects of pipeline construction to be managed by the compiler with the construction time checks uh, to clean up afterwards. Other primitive transforms like flattening and grouping by key uh, follow the same pattern. Composite P transforms are also implicit. Since we can't have an expand method on some abstract class, the Go SDK allows for composites uh, using a scope variable. Composite P transforms are nothing more than regular Go functions that happen to take a scope parameter, input P collections or other configuration, and return any of the output P collections. The scope uh, name can uh, be defined if desired and then passed to the subtransforms. Otherwise, there's no special handling from the SDK. One simply calls the functions as needed uh, to add them to a pipeline. Finally, we're down to the nitty gritty. How did Go's language features affect uh, DoFun authoring? When figuring out a DoFun API for a language, there are several things that need to be accounted for. If we don't, we could end up having the SDK being unable to implement the more advanced features of the Beam model. So we need to plan for growth early, even if we aren't implementing them just yet. Much of all of this is how we tell the runner and the pipeline graph what to expect. If we don't expose input and output types, we can't verify P collections match until it fails at pipeline execution time, let alone at construction time or compile time. Side inputs need to be mapped to their inputs. Output P collections need to be declared somehow. Access patterns for side inputs and other things need to be known so that the runner can take advantage of a DoFund's abilities and optimize its execution. So how do we define a DoFund? Go doesn't have inheritance or duct typing, so there are no base classes to extend or override uh, for something to be a DoFund. Instead, DoFunds are structs that have a process element method. Uh, so, sort of a form of duct typing. During pipeline construction, reflection is used to pull out our methods and parameters and to figure out uh, what a, the DoFund needs as input and provides as outputs so we can correctly type check the pipeline. But not all DoFunds need configuration or to support the bundle lifecycle with methods like start bundle, finish bundle, or so on. For that, plain functions can be treated as a process element called by themselves. Both approaches should be registered with the SDK in an init block to make sure that they can be accessed at execution time. So finally, what do the parameters look like? Well, for simple elements, they're just passed in as is, and in the simpler case, we're turned out after any transforms. Uh, key value pairs, though, uh, need some special handling. Go didn't have generics, nor did it have a tuple type. So the original S SDK authors opted to explode out KVs into two parameters. To have your DoFund accept KVs, you simply take it, uh, in, you, you have it take the key and value types as parameters. Uh, to have your DoFund return them, it's the same in reverse. 
return two values. Next up is emitters for defining output peak collections. The one thing Go does definitely have is first class functions. This gets as, this is pretty close to as generic as Go could get uh, up until recently. Not all do funds are one-to-one, -one, so having a function as a parameter is handy. Do funds can use these functions to emit zero or more times to these emitter functions. And naturally, they also support KVs. By having multiple of these, you can have, uh, several, you can, uh, have several uh, P collection outputs as well. And they will map to the same order as the returned P collections by the Pardue functions. Similarly, we have iterables for handling side inputs and the results of group by keys. Like emitters, there are functions with a slightly different signature. They take in the pointer type or pointer of the type and return a Boolean and can reuse a variable's allocation and can be concisely used in loops. Map side inputs, uh, as demonstrated by the lookup function kind of below, uh, let you look, look up values for a given key and get an iterator back for all values associated with that key, kind of a light version of group by key, but using side inputs. In the end, the position of side inputs and emitters in your process element signature will match the order needed in the beam pardu calls for pipeline construction. We call this the positional API. It's not the only way the API could have looked, but it's the only one we've got for now. Who knows? Maybe as Go continues to evolve, we'll be able to adopt a more tagged approach like Python and Java does in the future. Uh, to tie things off though, uh, community. When it comes to a new SDK, how Beam integrates with that language's tools is also important. If we don't, then users would be forced to handle things manually or with ad hoc scripts. This makes it harder on, to take on dependencies or integrate with other tools. The Go SDK isn't that new, but Go's mechanisms for these have only been prevalent for about two or three years. And for Go, a lot of this is very, very simple. We have the Go tool, which handles all of this from building your code and building and testing your code uh, to handling standard packaging, package managers, dependency management, documentation. Releases for the Beam SDK for Go is, is, is happens as soon as the GitHub repo is tagged with the appropriate version. That's it. The Go tools take care of the rest. Documentation becomes automatically available to uh, everyone on packagedgo.dev, and the Go module system uh, takes care of all the dependency management so that users can use the same things we're testing with or override them as needed. So as for our top level SDK question, we can I think we can modify our requirements a little. Uh, the Beam model should be implemented idiomatically for the language. It needs to be familiar to the users of that language, even if they aren't familiar with Beam yet. It also needs to integrate with the language's tools so that they're accessible to the community uh, for that language. I think that's a pretty reasonable bar. Um, and just before I finish up, uh, most of this talk is cobbled together from the following resources. There's the Go website, uh, Effective Go for authoring fairly idiomatic Go. Uh, and a lot of the original ideas for how the SDK is designed are contained in the Go SDK RFC. Uh, you can see a lot more examples in the, with the SDK overview and in the Beam programming guide. Uh, and that's what I've got for my slides. So thank you very much. I'm going to happily take and answer any and all questions you've got. And, and we had a question. Are there any benchmarks or information on performance comparisons uh, between, between pipelines? I mean, between so, languages, between languages? 
So the closest comparison that exists for the languages right now uh, mm -hmm. is on the, is the load tests on the metrics.beam.apache.org page, which I'm going to just go ahead and apparently my audio stopped. Um, now that was when I muted you for a bit um, while we were trying to sort out if it was your keyboard or not. And yeah, it was your keyboard, but yeah, then then you unmuted yourself and yeah, everything was okay. And then uh, da, 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 da. get rid of you. So you should be able to still hear me. Yes, right? we can hear you and we can see metrics.beam.apache.org. Yeah. So yeah, metrics.beam.apache.org is this particular page, uh, but we otherwise have uh, fairly, for at least most of the primitives and some very simple cases, uh, benchmarks that run uh, at least once daily for most of the languages. So we have Python numbers. Uh, most of these are currently on against uh, data flow, uh, although Java compares uh, also structured Spark streaming as well, uh, Python and uh, go as well. So we recently only fixed uh, the, the, the benchmarks. So these numbers are a little haphazard at the moment. Uh, but um, by default, unoptimized pipelines uh, end up taking a, a little uh, or a little faster than the equivalent Python. So that doesn't sound particularly fast, but this is the unoptimized version. Uh, we are making it so that it's much easier to uh, get to uh, bare metal tests uh, in uh, a newer version of the SDK uh, using uh, using actually generics, as it turns out. Uh, I omitted a lot of details on how we actually call our the various functions. Uh, by default, a lot of reflection is used heavily, but uh, we also designed the SDK so that we can uh, replace parts of that are using reflection to parts that are using things like type assertion. So literally, I merged in a PR yesterday that I'm going to just quickly look up, if you'll bear with me. Sure. Yeah, uh, just because that included a delightful benchmark. Uh, yeah. No. Is this For some reason, I couldn't, uh, I, I didn't, uh, oh, right, those were, those were other changes. Da, 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 file changes. So for uh, actually currently available now, there is in fact a code generator that you can run uh, and specify things. But because it's a process you need to run before and it's not kind of integrated with your code, it generates a lot of ugly code for that. Um, but uh, with generics, uh, we can get rid of the code generator and make it so that the compiler is doing a lot of this work for us. So uh, Danny McCormick uh, has been working with me on converting it to generics. And the reason I'm looking at this particular PR is I don't know how clear this is for y'all. I'm going to also just put that in the chat. And uh, But by default, for example, uh, just calling a non-optimized function takes whatever length of time the function takes, uh, plus a bunch of overhead for the reflection. So overall, this is around 300 nanoseconds or so. But when we optimize it, it gets down to eight nanoseconds. So right now, because the load tests uh, were only recently started up, uh, we are letting those run for a few days so we can kind of get a baseline for the optimized case uh, before we add the, uh, we, we demonstrate the optimized things. And this is all coming in the 2.40 release of Beam. Uh, we'll be updating all the examples and the documentation to make it clear and obvious how to use these things so you can get this performance out of the uh, SDK and for all your jobs. Uh, the fun fact about this is a lot of this stuff was very necessary for the use of the Go SDK internally uh, for, for, for Google, but it hasn't been as easy to externalize, even though it's always been developed in the open source world. It's 
there's just so many extra steps and we couldn't automate them generally. Uh, okay. Awesome, that's uh, an awesome resource, thank you. Uh, we didn't know about that one, metrics.beam.apache.org. Yeah, this is uh, accessible from the Beam page at the very bottom called Community Metrics. Okay, we'll check into that. We have a question from Fernando Garcia asking uh, if you have any idea of the estimate number of public templates that are available for Go, he assumes that it is lower than the ones available for Java, but it would help to, to have the number just to understand how the community is adapting or switching to Go based on the number okay. of public templates. So uh, templates is actually not a feature of Beam generally, but it is a feature of Google Cloud data flow. Oh, yeah, on that uh, flow, yeah. So, part, so uh, right now, uh, the template support is largely geared for Java, and a lot of templates are being maintained for Java. Uh, but there has been a sufficient interest in having those templates for data flow for Go. Uh, that we are currently working on uh, closing that gap. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, for those of you who don't know, the Go SDK is currently in preview on Google Cloud Dataflow, uh, which means you can use it, get support, and ideally tell us, what, uh, tell us about things that annoy you with it so we can fix it and make it continue to make it better.